It's good to see everybody this morning. I am Nathan, pastor of ministries here at Ebenezer, and it's wonderful to be joining you in worship this morning. Uh, that is for our members, obviously, but also for our guests. If you are a guest this morning, thank you for joining us. I know this is a very odd time, so we do not take it for granted that you have come through our doors and you've come to worship with us. Thank you for being here. If you will, do us a favor this morning, and before you leave, there is a card in a little stand on the welcome desk out there in the lobby. It just asks for your name and a little bit of information. We would just love to have record of your visit this morning, be able to connect with you and be able to pray with you and for you. Um, there's a place on the back for prayer requests and all kinds of things on there. So just grab one of those, fill it out, if you will, and place it in a plate or hand it to one of us, and, uh, and we'll take care of that. If you are a first-time guest and you're watching online right now, uh, you clearly cannot fill out one of those cards. So if you will, just send us an email or put a note there on Facebook. We'll get in contact with you very quickly. A couple of quick announcements. I meant to bring a baby bottle up here with me, but I didn't. There's still a couple of those in the lobby right now. Today is actually the day to turn those in. So if you want to take one of those bottles and write a check and stick it in there, or if you've got a bunch of change in the bottom of your purse or out there in your car, you can go and grab that and stick it in the bottle and just set it on that table. That is to support the Help Pregnancy Care Center. And we would love to uh, take all of that money and give that to them to support what they're doing there. Um, just to put it on your radar, there is a women's Bible study sign up out there on the welcome desk as well. We've got about seven or eight people already signed up. Uh, that's going to be a great study for any women that want to take part in that. So just stop by that desk and sign up. There's also a sign up, sign up over there for Easter lilies um, as well. So you can take a look at that. Uh, just a reminder, the Young Adult Fellowship, 630 on Wednesday nights. So if you have not participated there, we are in the chapel every single Wednesday night from ages 18 to 25. Uh, we would love to have you there. We have a great time together and do a little bit of Bible study together. Now, tonight, things are a little bit different tonight. Has anyone else noticed that any company that you call nowadays, there's the same message. It says, please listen carefully as our menu options have recently changed don't understand how they've all changed at the same time, but they have. But for this morning, please listen carefully because our schedule has recently changed. We have uh, our student ministry is still meeting at the regular time tonight, although the chapel will be open early for any that come early at 5 o'clock. They can come in there. Um, all of the rest of the programming, the adult Bible study, choir, uh, the Awana for children, it's all taking place from 5 o'clock until 6 o'clock this evening. It is not the normal 6 o'clock time, so from 5 to 6 is when that's taking place this evening. All right, did you listen carefully to the menu options that changed? Everybody's got it. Awesome. All right, I think that's all of the announcements that I've got. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Psalms. Uh, I do want to say this actually beforehand. For those of you that are doing the reading plan, we have now moved into the book of Mark, yes? I want to make this clear. As we're reading through the Gospels, we already finished the book of Matthew, we're moving into the book of Mark. There are no contradictions, so don't allow that to start happening in your mind. Remember, these are different people that have written about the same things from different perspectives, right? If there's any place where you see what you think is a contradiction, I'd love to talk to you about that. I know Pastor Jeremy would love to talk to you about that. Uh, do some study and some commentaries. It's awesome to see what these four guys wrote about the same things. Let the Lord speak to you through that and really enjoy those different perspectives. Amen? Amen. Just felt like I should say that. Psalm 100 is where our call to worship comes from. That's going to come up on the screen. Will you read this with me this morning? It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Worship with us this morning. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing Days of Elijah. We're excited this morning. Three young people are about to be baptized in a display of their 
uh, commitment to Christ and turning their lives to Christ. And the words of this song came to mind this week, that we are your laborers in the vineyard declaring the Lord, <clears throat> and the fields are as white in the world. We have a job to go and tell people about Christ. And we're excited about that this morning to be able to see God moving in our church and in our families. Let's sing. You got to sing this one loud. Days of Elijah. Once again, are able to uh, fill up um, our baptismal waters, and we need to, and we get to celebrate together as a church family um, commitments made to following Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Um, today, we have um, the privilege of seeing Autumn Luther, Jameson Melton, and Jacob Melton all making those professions of faith in Christ public through believers' baptism today. I want to read a passage of scripture in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Paul says, do you, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
It is an obedience to the command in Scripture that we baptize today. It is an outward symbol of something that has inwardly taken place. And as Paul describes it in Romans, and as we are sinners, we are dead in our sins. And as Christ died, we, we are buried with Christ in baptism, and we are raised to walk in a new life with Christ. It's why we Baptists believe that baptism by immersion is the best symbol of what takes place in the life of a believer. We are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are buried with Christ, and then we are raised with Christ to a newness of life. And today we celebrate that in obedience to the scriptures we baptize. So let's start with Autumn. Come on down, Autumn. And if you want to stand, do you want to stand on this? All right. So this is Autumn Luther. Many of you um, have had the privilege of being a part of her life, investing in her life. There's many people here today um, that have taught her in Sunday school or Awana, have been able to just pour into her and invest in her. Um, Many family uh, that's here today that that have all taken part um, in where she is today. And today is a start of a new life in Christ for her. For many of you, um, she actually made her profession of faith public uh, many months ago before COVID, and then we had to kind of figure out when we were going to schedule everything. So today is that day where we can, we, we can have her family here, we can have our church family here, um, and we can celebrate this together. So Autumn, space me. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the grave? Because of your profession of faith in Jesus, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, ways to walk in a new life. All right, let me have Jameson come on down. This is Jameson Melton, um, and like all of many of you know Jameson, and many of you have had the opportunity to invest in his life, to teach him, and to, and to just encourage him. Many of you family here today have taken part in his life, and today there are days like today that are a reminder that the little things that you do, that the investments that you make in children's lives, they matter, and days like today are days that we can celebrate that. So, Jameson, why don't you step up here? Jameson, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Yes. And that he rose from the grave three days later? Yes. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in the new life. Jacob, come on down. So this is big brother Jacob Melton. And Jacob um, has been part of our church um, for a long time. And I've watched him uh, grow uh, physically and spiritually. So it is a real privilege for me to be able to to be a part of this and to see this as it is for many of you. Um, Like Autumn and Jameson, you all have invested in the lives of these children, and we see the fruit of that labor today. So, Jameson, um, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose three days later from the grave? Yes. Okay. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. Grace to walk in a new life. Church, before we pray, I want to remind you that this is the starting point for life in Christ. This is day one for them. 
as they have made this profession and they're taking this step forward. And what I encourage you to do is recognize that these are three children that need to be prayed for. They are three children that need to be invested in. They are three children that need to be loved and supported and encouraged. They are three children that have just made a commitment to Christ and there's an enemy that does not like what he has seen today. So we need to be praying, we need to be encouraging, we need to be supporting, um, we need to be investing in um, their lives. That's why we're here as a church. Let's pray. Dear God, we are thankful. We're thankful for your grace and mercy. We're thankful that in the midst of all that's going on around us and all the chaos that surrounds us, that Jesus Christ is on the throne and that he is saving people. And God, we are so thankful that we get to be a part of that. We're so thankful for these lives, for Autumn and for Jameson and for Jacob. And God, we pray for them. We pray for their families, we pray for their parents, and we pray for this church. God, I pray that we would be a church that would love them and support them, encourage them and pray for them, invest in them. And God, we recognize that there's so many around us that need the good news of the gospel. God, I pray that we would be bold witnesses to share it. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing how he loves us, how he loves us. <coughs> <coughs>
the grace in his eyes if his grace is an ocean we're all sinking and heaven needs earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns light on the inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I Morning. If you have your Bibles, open with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 13. So 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Let us pray. Dear God, we are thankful. We're thankful for what we've been able to witness today. We're thankful for the way we've been able to worship today. We're thankful for the way that we've been able to gather here today. You are a good God in ways that we could not even understand or fathom. You're good in ways that we don't always see in the moment. You are good when we are not. And God, we are thankful for your grace and mercy. We're thankful for your love, a love that is hard for us to comprehend a love that never um, fades, a love that perseveres. And God, I pray that as we look at your word this morning, I pray that as we prepare ourselves 
for an encounter with the God of the universe. God, I pray you'd speak to us. God, I pray that you would use me simply to deliver your word to your people, the people that you love. And God, I pray that as we hear your word this morning, that it would change our hearts, our lives, and we could leave here and never be the same again. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, oftentimes um, when we think about living the Christian life and when we think about um, becoming a Christian and living as a Christian, oftentimes we are under the, um, the assumption that life is going to get easier. In fact, there's many people that would, would preach that. That would say that, that, the, that, that, that to be a Christian, to follow Christ, that once you become a Christian, that life is going to be easier for you, and that if it's not becoming easier for you, then it probably means that you're not being faithful enough, you're not praying the right prayers, you're not um, obeying God the right way. There's something wrong with your life or your prayers or your faith if life is difficult. If being a Christian is not leading you to a life of ease and a life of comfort, then you must be doing something wrong. And what we see is that throughout the word of God, that is uh, completely um, uh, inconsistent. When we think about Christians living in a fallen world, we think that as we, as we grow in, in, in our faith that it should become easier to live out the Christian life. It should be easier for us to be obedient to the word of God. It should be easier for us to be faithful. And, set, and many of you probably have asked yourself this question, why is it so hard for me? Why does it seem like everybody around me has it easy and that living the Christian life seems to be easy for other people? But for me, I'm struggling. It's a daily struggle for me. Is there something wrong with me? Why do I face the temptations I face? Why do I struggle in the areas that I struggle? Why does it seem to be living the Christian life the way that God would have me to live, the way that the Bible would instruct me to live? Why is it so hard? What is wrong with me. I think some of you may even think that for me as a pastor that it's easier. Well, you know, you're you're a pastor. You went to you went to school for this. You know, you study the Bible. You read the Bible. You're surrounded, you know, with, with Christians. Like, that, that, it's probably easier for you to do what the Bible says. It's probably easier for you to live the life that God would have you to live. It's probably easier for you, right? And the reality is, is that as a pastor, developing a strong prayer and devotional life is a struggle. It's not intuitive. It's not easy. That temptation is not less for pastors. That marriage is not easy and struggle-free for pastors. That raising kids is not easy for pastors. It's a struggle. It's a daily struggle that we're all walking in together. So um, a friend of mine who was skiing in Utah um, sent me a picture this week. So this is a real picture. I didn't just download this on the um, the internet that he sent me at the top of a ski slope in Utah. Um, that's not a good sign, okay, when you're at the top of the mountain and you come to this sign. Um, so this is the sign that as he's skiing down on um, the mountain that he kind of finds himself um, facing. And you know, I told him, I said, I'm going to use this in a sermon uh, probably this week because I believe that this is actually really what the Christian life looks like. That oftentimes we think about the picture of ease, we think about the picture of life getting easier, but I I believe that once you become a Christian, and this was the case for Peter, and this was the case for the people that, that Peter was talking to, is that what happened is once they professed Christ as their Lord and Savior, once they identified themselves as Christians, once they were raised from the dead and given a new life,
they came to that sign. There's no easy way beyond this point. And to think otherwise would be not to understand the Word of God. Because Peter, and you could pull that down now, but Peter is living this out. Peter is speaking to a group of people that followed Jesus that gave their life to following Jesus. And there's probably times where they are perplexed and confused and discouraged because life isn't getting easier. In fact, life is just getting harder. The pressure is getting more intense. The persecution that they're facing is not letting up. And so he starts to speak into this. Now the last couple weeks, if you were with us, Peter's first talking to this group of people that are experiencing this, and he's saying, listen, lift your eyes up, right? Lift your eyes up. Your eyes are on the circumstances. Your eyes are on what's surrounding you. Your eyes are on the difficulty. Your eyes are on everything around you and all that's happening and all that that you're facing, and it can be paralyzing. And I think for many of you, that's that's where you're at right now. You're, You're looking around at everything around you Everything you're facing, everything that's surrounding you, everything that you're dealing with, everything that you're struggling with, all the what-ifs in life. And Peter's talking to a group of people that are experiencing that, and he's first encouraging them, lift your eyes up. Remember who Jesus is. Remember what he's done. Remember what he's promised Remember how he's already, how God has already made good on his promise that the Messiah would come and that he's promised that Jesus will return. Lift your eyes up. But also, Peter's going to encourage them to look inward. So to look up to God, to look up to Jesus to look inward into our hearts. And why is that? Because if you think about this, that Christ has saved us from this world, that he has given us a new identity, and we are called to live a life in light of that. Let's look in verse 13. If you have your Bible still open, 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll start in verse 13. It says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, there is a therefore, and so many of you that have grown up kind of in Sunday school and all that have always heard the phrase, if there's a therefore, you ask, come on, help me, come on. Why is it therefore? I knew somebody, I knew somebody could help me out, all right? So what it is, is it's, it's connecting. So he's going to say, in, in light of this, in light of what I've just told you, in light of what I have just explained to you, in light of where I have taken your eyes to, in light of what I have reminded you of, in light of the, of the fact that you have been saved from this world, in light of the fact that this is not your home, in light of the fact that you have been guaranteed an inheritance, guaranteed a future, given a salvation, a salvation that cannot be taken from you, a salvation that does not fade, a salvation that has been secured, a salvation that's been guarded by Christ himself because you have been set free from the bondage of your sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, what are we to do? Therefore, how are we to live? Therefore, how are we to focus. Well, here's what I want us to consider, is that as he is calling us to look inward, as Peter is calling these people to look inward, to look at their hearts, to look at their lives, to look at how they're living, because here's here's the reality, is that most of the times if you're struggling with something, 
and all of us are at different times, you want the conversation to just be there, right? You just want to say, let's, let's just talk about the problems. Let's just talk about what's going on in the world. Let's just talk about what I'm experiencing. Let's just talk about this and give me, give me a solution. Like, what do I do? What do I do about this? And Peter's saying, lift your eyes up to Jesus. And then here's what he's going to go. Right to their hearts. And say, how are you living in light of the hope that you found in Jesus? And here's the truth. That most of the time, external things are not the real problem in our lives. And here's and you, and you may push back and say, no, Jeremy, they are the problem. Like, I can give you the list of problems, and here's the list of problems, and here's how every one of those things has affected my life. And the reason that I can't sleep at night is because of these problems. And the reason that I worry all the time is because of these problems. And I guarantee you that if you would remove these problems from my life, then my life would get better. But here's the reality. The problem for most of you is not the external things. It's your heart. I want to give you an example. Best one I could think of, which isn't that great. But imagine you have one of those days where you're going to a really important meeting, okay? So whatever that is for you, super important. You're going to this important meeting. You're on your way there. Your car breaks down, okay? On your way there. You have no way to fix it. So you get out in your clothes that you're wearing for this important meeting and you know that you don't know how to fix your car and you don't know how you're going to make it to this meeting and then another car drives by that you're hoping might stop you know and help you instead they drive by splash a puddle mud goes all over you so now any hope that you have of making it to that meeting has been dashed because now you look terrible in that moment all you're thinking about is why is this happening I need to be at a meeting, everything's going wrong, the problem and all the, the kind of the anger and the frustration and everything that's going on inside of me is because my car broke down and my outfit got ruined. But what if we stop there? And what if we pause there? And what if we examine our heart there and ask a couple questions? Like, why did you assume that your day was going to go the way you planned it? Why, when you got in your car that morning with your nice suit or nice dress on, did you assume that everything was going to go the way that you planned it? Why was that meeting so important, really? Why did you feel like you could not miss it, really? Why would it... Why would your arrival to that meeting late and looking really, really bad probably be a no-go for you? See, if we examine some of those things, what we might find is the real problem wasn't the turn of events that happened that morning. It was our desire to be in control of things, our idea that whatever we set our mind to is going to happen, our need to be in that meeting for whatever reason, like life's not going to go on without us. And even our image of coming into that meeting dressed a certain way to give a certain impression so people will think a certain thing about us. And when all of that gets crushed on the side of the road, here's what gets revealed to you. Your heart. But here's what, here's what happens most of the time. Most of the time, we never get there. Most of the time, we never get to that point. We never ask those type of questions. We never look inside. We just stay focused on the outside. And this is what we do. We come away from that. The meeting gets ruined. We, we get a new suit or whatever that may be. And we tell stories all day about the bad day that we have. And that's really all we've learned from it. And Peter is going to take a group of Christians that are suffering and he's going to point them back, and we're going to see this over subsequent weeks, to their own hearts. And then secondly, 
problems and stress can cause us to drift into worldly and fleshly living. Problems and stress can cause us to go back to bad habits. Problems and stress can cause us to give up the fight for the faith. Problems and stress can cause us to give in. Problems and stress can allow us to go and buy what the world is selling. It does something inside of our minds. And that's where it starts. And that's where Peter begins. Because if he says, he says, therefore, because of this salvation, let me read, therefore be preparing your minds for action. So if you think about this idea, right, what he's saying, he's say, he's, first off, he's saying, preparing your minds for action. And some of your translations may even have it written kind of girding up, right? It's, it's, it's this imagery of a soldier becoming prepared for battle. It's this idea of suiting up. It's this idea of being prepared. He says, prepare your minds for action, meaning prepare your minds for the battle that is ahead for you because that's where it's going to start. If you think about all the problems in your life and all the bad decisions that you've made and all the sins that you have committed, where does it start? It doesn't start on the outside. It starts in your mind. Where is your mind? And are you preparing your mind for what is ahead. And so this idea, this mindset shift, right, is kind of like the sign that we saw on the picture. There is a mindset that when you come down to a ski slope and you see a sign in front of you that says, there's no easy way from here, what happens in the mind of the person that comes up to that sign? They think differently. They are prepared differently. There is a certain preparing for battle, right, that is going to await them ahead. They are thinking that way. They are preparing that way. There are, their minds are there. A call to holiness is going to be a battle in your mind. Your mind is a battlefield. It's a source of all types of problems. And we should prepare. We should recognize it's going to be a fight. We should recognize it's going to be a war. And our approach is different when we think that way. When we mentally prepare that this is not going to be easy, when we expect a struggle, when we know that a fight is coming. And then he says, he says, prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. So what it, why are we called to be sober? Well, the reality is, is that anything that would distort our minds and our ability to make decisions when there is a literal battle going on inside of your mind is not going to be good for us. I mean, if you think about that, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Could you imagine a person at the top of that slope looking at that sign, heavily intoxicated. What's getting ready to happen? Bad things, right? Bad things are getting ready to happen. Why? Because this was going to be tough by itself. This was going to be a battle by itself. This was going to take clear focus. This was a war zone that they're going into, and they're going into it without a clear mind to begin with, with decisions being distorted, without a focus on the right things. See, we are to be clear-minded. We are to be sober. We are to have our mindset on the Word of God. And we should be putting a priority on that. If you think about just the way that many of us start a day, how are you starting your day? Many of us start our day clouding our minds with worry and cares of the world. But we should be preparing our minds for battle through the word of God. We should be preparing our minds for battle through the word of God. What are we feeding into our minds that day? What are we meditating on? What are we thinking about? What comes to mind throughout our day should be the word of God. We are called to be sober-minded. And he says that we are to prepare our minds for action and be sober-minded, to set our hope fully on the grace that 
brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we are to fight this mental battle with the gospel. The gospel is our answer. It is where we put our hope. It's not in ourselves. It's not in the world. Our hope is set on Christ. It is by the grace of Jesus that I'm going to have the ability to get down this hill today. That's the reality is that we, we come to that point, we come to that sign, we see that there is a need for me to be sober-minded, there is a need for me to be anchored to the word, there is a need for me to have my mind clear, to know that there is a battle ahead, to know that it is going to be hard, but there's also a need to know that it's only going to be through the grace of Jesus Christ that I get to the bottom, that I'm not going to do this on my own. And that I can get to the bottom because I'm not doing this on my own. And so it is by the grace of Jesus that I'm going to have the ability to get down this hill. But I also know that I have an active role because I'm not going to show up to the mountain drunk and sing Jesus take the wheel. Right? And some of us, that's exactly what we're doing in our lives. We, we, we wake up, we are consumed with whatever the world's throwing at us. We are, we are filled with our worry. We are filled with our anxiety. We, have, we, we, we haven't read our Bible in weeks or days. We have not prayed. And then we get in the middle of a situation. We say, Jesus, take the wheel. But Peter doesn't say for us to do that. Peter says we have an active role in the renewing of our minds, in the preparing of our minds, into being sober-minded, and then in the midst of that also recognizing that it is only through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that we will be able to do anything of importance to God today. Our role in the Holy Spirit's role in our sanctification as a Christian. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So in verse 14, what we see is we see that we are to, first we see that we're, we are to prepare our minds We are to have the right mindset. We are to be anchored in the word of God. We are to be filling ourselves with the word. And then we are to be obedient children. Now there's two choices because obedient means that you have a choice one way or the other. And we have a choice as obedient that we can either be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. That is a choice that we can make. That is a way that we can live. Peter says, and he's saying this to Christians, don't go there. And let's break that down. Because here's what we see is that we see, first off, he says, do not, right? He says, do not be conformed, right? So conforming, if you think about just the word conformed, is outside in, right? It's like taking a a piece of clay and molding it from the outside into something. So Peter's saying, listen, don't be conformed from the outside in, from the, what the world is telling you, what the world is selling you, what the world is doing to you. Don't, don't be conformed by the, by the world. Don't be conformed, he says, to the passions of your former ignorance. So first off, we see conformed, right? Outside in, don't be, don't be shaped from the outside in, from the passions. Now, when we look at just the Greek translation there, it's, it's desires, right? It's passion, it's desire, it's what feels good. Here's the reality. That people that tell you to just go with your heart are lying to you if they're Christian. Because our heart is deceitful. Who can trust it? Our heart will lie to us. Our feelings will lie to us. Our flesh will lie to us. What feels good will lie to us. We will be in a moment and we will say, you know what, this just feels right. Or this just seems right. And in that moment we are being 
lied to. We are not to live that way because before Christ, before the word of God was your authority, how are you to live? If the word's, a word of God's not your authority, then what is? What feels right? What feels good? What seems right? What satisfies your fleshly desire? Peter says, that's how you used to live. That's how you used to operate. But you died to that self. And Christ raised you to a new life. And so don't be conformed by the passions of your former ignorance. Now, former ignorance means that there was a time, and even as we grow in Christian, Christ, as a Christian, right, in sanctification, here's what happens, is that as we encounter the Word of God, as we study the Word of God, as we understand the Word of God, as the Word of God speaks into our lives, here's what happens. We recognize more and more and more of our own ignorance, how are we supposed to live? Well, we don't know how we're supposed to live because we've been living based off of what feels good and what the world's telling us. But now we have an authority. And that authority is the word of God. And the word of God doesn't change. And that's how we're supposed to live. And Peter says, don't go back to your former ignorance. Now, you know, it's, um, it's interesting because we live in a day and time were people that say that if you believe cover to cover what the word of God says is true, that if you believe that there's only one way to salvation and that's a faith in Jesus Christ alone, that if you believe that what the word of God says is the final authority of your, on your life, that it doesn't need to be revised, doesn't need to be updated, there doesn't need to be asterisks next to things and say that doesn't apply to you, that if you believe that to be true, then you are narrow-minded and you are ignorant. And let me remind you of something. There's two, ways we, there's two things we can follow as Christians. We can listen to the creator of the universe who has revealed himself to us in his word. And we can believe that it is perfect and without error and given to us by God to reveal himself and to show us who we are in light of him. Or we can listen to the created. And I don't know about you, but um, I got a pretty strong opinion on what's ignorant. That the created says to the creator, we know better. You can call me all ignorant and narrow-minded all you want. But I'm going with the Bible. And that's just how we're supposed to live. And, and, and listen to me. We should be unashamed of that. We should be unashamed of that as Christians. That we believe that that is our authority because God wrote it. And he created all things. And so then Peter goes and says, don't do this. Don't live this way. Here's, here's how you are to live. He says, be holy. And be holy because Christ is holy. So Christ is your example. Christ is the way that you are to live. Now, here's the, the, the frustrating part in the Christian life is we will never be able to fully on this earth live as Christ lived. We're going to come short. We're going to sin. We're going to do the things that we don't want to do. Paul even acknowledges this himself. But he calls us, Peter says, be holy. Be holy, strive for holiness, because Christ is holy. Christ is our example. Christ is who we follow. Christ is our aim. You want me to tell you one of the biggest temptations we have as Christians? Letting other Christians be the authority for our life. One of the problems that we have as Christians is that we will let other Christians be our example and not Christ. 
Now, some of you might say, what do you mean? We're supposed to be examples. Yes, we are. We're supposed to be examples to each other. We are. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, right? We are called to be examples. But here's what I want us to be careful of. Christians are sinful. Christians fall into temptation. Christians live in ways that are not consistent with the word of God. And so the the example that we are to look at is Christ himself. And so when we see someone else next to us and their life doesn't square with the Bible, that's not what we're supposed to follow. And we're not supposed to tell ourselves it's okay. I I want you to listen to me, students here. Because when I've been a student and I've been in student ministry, and I can tell you one of the biggest temptations in your life right now, is allowing things to be okay because your Christian friends are allowing them to be okay. One of the biggest temptations in your life right now is not the non-Christian people around you doing the wrong thing. And you know that's wrong. You know they're not Christian. No, it's that the Christian friends that you have that are compromising and you're saying to yourself, well, if they compromise, then maybe it's okay and maybe it's not a big deal. And listen, Peter's talking to a group of Christians He said, don't do that. You look to Christ. Your example is Jesus. That's who you are following. It would be, and and I say that to students, but I say that to parents. I say that to husbands and wives. I say that to those in the room that are single Don't look around at the other Christians and what they've permitted in their life if you know it's not consistent with the word of God and give yourself a pass. Peter is clear. Our example is Christ. Imagine this. Going down the hill. Jesus is leading, right? And a group of Christians go off careening towards a cliff and you follow them. Bad idea, right? We need to be careful. That's why what happens, it all comes back to the word of God as the authority in your life. Listen, if you are surrounded by a group of Christians and you look at the word of God and you say, this just doesn't square with what I'm reading in the word of God. You know what you need to do? You need to go with the word of God. That's what you need to do. You need to let that be your authority. And then Peter says that we are, says, and since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout your time of exile. And so we're not talking about a Um, a a fear like we are afraid of God, we are afraid to approach God, we are afraid to be in a relationship with God, but we have a fear. We should fear God's discipline, right? We should love God's discipline. We should be grateful that we have a gracious God that disciplines us, but we shouldn't love it. We shouldn't look forward to it. Right? If, if discipline works in your home, then, then children shouldn't be looking forward to it. There's a day where they'll be thankful for it. So we should fear the discipline of God. We should not desire his discipline. We should be living in a way where we are grateful that God loves us that way, but we should have a fear of not wanting to live outside of his will for our lives. A fear of not wanting to live contrary to our word, his word. Simply put, we should be much more worried about what God thinks than what our friends, family, and coworkers think. And the reality for many of us, if we're all honest, is many days we go through our lives with a greater fear of man than of the God of the universe that we are much more worried about what others think about us than what God knows about us. And that should be of great concern to each one of us. Peter is reminding them of that. Verse 18, 
knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So here's the reality is that you are not only purchased by the blood of Christ to go to heaven, but you were also purchased by the blood of Christ to live in obedience to Jesus now. He says, you were saved for holiness now. There was a price that was paid for your freedom, and that price was way more valuable than gold or silver or anything the world has to offer, that the price, the ransom that was paid for you to set you free, to release you from the bondage of your sin, was the blood of Jesus Christ. And he has set us free so that we can live in obedience to him and pursue a life of holiness now. And it's why we should take this seriously. But oftentimes we don't. You know, we just had three children a day baptized. And you know what a lot of times we are guilty of in the church? It would be like taking that group of new skiers to a sign like that and saying, good luck. Be a bad idea, wouldn't it? We need to recognize that we were bought by the blood of Jesus for holy living, and that it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a war. It's going to take a fight. And as a church, we are to come together, and we are to fight together. We are to encourage each other together. We are to pray for each other together. We are to be honest and open with each other about the fight that's happening. Because a lot of times, here's what happens in our lives. We just act like everything's okay, like we're not fighting. And then people around us are like, man, well, Jeremy seems like he's doing good. Christian living seems easy for him. Why is it so hard for me? And here's the reality for every one of us. Every single one of us in this room, if you are pursuing holiness, if you are trying to live according to the word of God, it is a fight. And it is a struggle. And you need encouragement and support and prayer and the Holy Spirit. And our children need that from us as a church. And people at all stages and all walks of their spiritual life need that from us and from each other. It's why we are a church. It's why what we do is so important. We need each other as we seek to follow Jesus together. Jesus paid the price to set you free so that you can live a life following Jesus and pursuing holiness now. So when we look up to Jesus, we look in to our own hearts and our own lives, it keeps us from looking out to what's surrounding us. Let's pray. Dear God, we are thankful for your word and the way it challenges us. We're thankful that it is our final authority. We're thankful that we can read it and that through through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can understand it and we can apply it. And God, I just pray that each one of us today, wherever we've strayed and wherever we've struggled, wherever we've given in to the world, wherever we have bought what the world is selling, whatever, wherever we have compromised, God, I pray that today would be a day because we have been purchased, ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ because there was no payment that was too high for our lives, that we have been bought by the blood of Jesus to live holy. God, I pray today that each one of us in this room 
would commit ourselves to live like that. God, I pray that today we would commit ourselves to encourage those around us to live like that. God, I pray that we would recognize that it is a fight that we cannot win on our own. That because of Christ, because of his grace and mercy, that we have been set free to follow him because of the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us as Christians. Then succumbing to temptation is not our only option. That living based off what the word of God says is not only probable, it's guaranteed. God, I pray that we would recognize together that we're in a battle and that we would fight together. Because through the struggles and the hardship and the pain, we recognize that we've been given something far greater, that our struggle, that our hardship, that our pain, that everything that this life has cost us as we follow Christ is worth it. Allow us to be bold witnesses of our faith in a world that desperately needs to hear the message of Christ. Let us be unashamed that we follow the one true living God that created this earth, earth, this universe, and put air in our lungs. Let us be unashamed that we realize that we recognize and we believe that there is one way to salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ himself, because the Bible tells us so. And let us recognize that we live in a world that needs Jesus, people that need to feel and experience the love of Christ. Let us be those people. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this is the time for you to respond however God is leading you this morning, whatever God is convicting you of, wherever God is laying on your heart. There may be a decision you need to make today. There may be a commitment you need to make today. There may be a sin that you need to repent of today. I don't know what that is for you. But Jesus, through his blood shed on the cross, has purchased you and given you the opportunity today that you don't have to live the way the world's telling you to live. That there is a better way, and that better way is possible through Christ himself. Let's stand and sing.
quickly, um, before we uh, dismiss today, I wanted just to, um, we're going to make these available in the lobby, but there's a, um, uh, a few cards that we have received um, recently, um, and I'm not going to read each one of them to you, but I'm going to make them available so that you can uh, read them. But one of them um, is from, the, uh, from Jody Mills and his family and the passing of his uh, father. Uh, one is from um, Beth Presley uh, and the passing of her husband, Danny, and then um, from Jerry Philman um, and just the time that he has been out um, through his different I issues that he's had. Um, but what I want, us, want you to remind you is that the love that you show to the people here in this church is felt. It matters. I see so many of you reaching out in ways that nobody really ever knows and caring for people and calling people and taking meals to people and loving people. And I just want to remind you, it matters. It matters. And we are a church that I love to be a part of because uh, we're a church that cares about people. We care about each other. We take care of each other. Um, these cards, they reflect that. And so if you have a chance, uh, they'll be out in the lobby. Come by, read those words um, that they have expressed just gratitude for the way that you have loved them and cared for each one of them uh, well. And with that, um, I want us dismiss, sing us out, whatever you want to do, Steve. Let's sing the third <laughs> verse. It may be through the shadows dim.